Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about just a few things that are percolating right now in the world of boxing. Then I want to dive into a post-fight report on Sergei Kovalev's victory over Cedric Agnew, right? You know, there's a lot of misinformation that's uh, being thrown out uh, right now in boxing, right? For example, uh, in the 24-7, the first episode, Manny Pacquiao, Timothy Bradley, Pacquiao makes the claim that he was just being a nice guy in the ring with Timothy Bradley. That if he wanted, he could have stepped on the gas and taken him out. Right? He wants you to believe that it was just his mercy that kept Timothy Bradley upright in that fight. Now let me point out the obvious. Right? Understand Pacquiao lost the later rounds of that fight on the judges scorecards. We could argue here all day on who actually won those rounds and stuff like that. Take a look at the last three rounds of the fight. Understand that I believe it's only in one of those rounds that any of the judges gave that round to Manny Pacquiao. In other words, of the nine outcomes, right, the nine individual cards that got handed in for the last three rounds of the fight, right, there are three judges, right, each submitted their scoring for one of those rounds, right, of the nine possible scorecards for the last three rounds, Timothy Bradley won eight of them, right, eight. So understand the entire theme of Manny Pacquiao showing mercy is ludicrous because Pacquiao lost those rounds right in other words he's not beating up Bradley and then deciding I'm not gonna knock him down right you know this isn't a 10-9 round in his favor where he's thinking okay well should I throw that last punch to have this guy who's reeling around the canvas hit the canvas. No, this is a different scenario entirely. Look at the CompuBots numbers. Understand, I understand the connect rates are different. But understand, Timothy Bradley threw more punches than Manny Pacquiao. So if I'm supposed to believe Manny Pacquiao, then this veteran fighter has no idea what a close fight is. He's fighting a guy who throws more punches than him, right? He's not winning the last three rounds. And you're telling me he decides then and there not to step on the gas? That would indicate to me that what Bradley's saying is true. And Manny Pacquiao has lost the fire. Let's shift gears. Leonard Ellerby. Team Mayweather. I have a lot of respect for Team Mayweather. I consider Floyd Mayweather to be a visionary in the sport. Let's remember, Floyd, when he came out and said, I want drug testing in my matches, actually faced a lot of blowback. At first, it was kind of like a joke. People like Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Boxing Hall of Famer, in my opinion, one of the best middleweight champs in history said, hey, Floyd needs to fight. A lot of old-timers said, drug testing, what's that? We didn't have drug testing in the 70s. We didn't have drug testing in the 80s. But of course, right now it's different. Right? We know that in professional athletics, even in an Olympics 100-meter final, you remember Ben Johnson, 1988, that some of the winners were juicing. We know in boxing, many top 
level fighters, right? Future Hall of Famer Antonio Tarver have failed drug tests. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., look it up, right? Have failed drug tests. Understand, too, the drugs don't necessarily have to be steroids because boxing, unlike sports like baseball, is actually weight-based. There are weight classes. So if a guy is taking diuretics to artificially cut weight so that he's able to make the weigh-in in a weight class much lower than what he normally would be able to make if he wasn't on the illegal substances, then that would give him a competitive advantage. Right? So I consider Floyd Mayweather to be extremely valuable to the sport, not just in terms of his technical brilliance as a boxer, but also as a custodian of the sport. Right? So I look at Leonard Ellerby as part of Team Mayweather. Now, Ellerby gave a you know, uh, interview to a member of the press recently where he claimed that, you know, uh, Manny Pacquiao is going to be too much for Timothy Bradley, that Manny Pacquiao won the first fight. I understand many people will agree with him, right? And, of course, the tone of the interview seemed designed to try to diminish Timothy Bradley, right? And, of course... You know, Ellerby made the claim that the only reason that Floyd hasn't fought Manny Pacquiao was because of Bob Arum, the promoter of both Pacquiao and Bradley. Now, let's just clear up a few things. First, understand that boxing is like politics, right? When you look at individuals like Leonard Ellerby, you need to ask yourself who's paying his salary, right? Guys like Leonard Ellerby don't work for some league office, right? You know boxing, right? The idea of a league just doesn't comport, right? These guys aren't employees of the sport. They're employees of particular participants in the sport. So I wouldn't expect a top-ranked employee to badmouth a top-ranked fighter. I wouldn't expect Leonard Ellerby to do anything other than to make statements that cast Floyd Mayweather, his employer, in the most favorable light possible. Right? But let's use common sense. In terms of whose era is this at a hundred at 47 pounds. Timothy Bradley's unbeaten right now. Right? The people he's beaten, Kendall Holt, when Kendall Holt was on top of the world. Devin Alexander, when Devin was unbeaten. Understand, Alexander goes on and gets a title. Right? Lamont Peterson, before Peterson gets the title. Right? One man well, Marquez, right after Marquez knocks out Manny Pacquiao. And of course, the controversial Manny Pacquiao fight. Understand, whatever you thought of the first fight, Bradley's fighting Pacquiao again. Bradley wants to remove the doubt. Right? And so, the idea that Bradley's not fighting anyone, that's laughable. That's silly. Right? The only kind of person who would make a statement like that is someone with a political agenda, who of course works for one of Bradley's competitors. Right? Now, I believe, obviously, that Floyd Mayweather is the cash cow in the division. There's no question about that in my mind. Just look at the numbers from Floyd against Canelo, a recent fight. Right? Floyd Mayweather generates numbers. Mayweather has multiple pay-per-view events that cleared $2 million. 
pay-per-viewers, right? So he's clearly, you know, big time. He's also been testing himself. Canelo was unbeaten when he fought Floyd Mayweather, right? Marcus Maidana, his next fight, actually has a title, right? Mayweather, stylistically, is even talking about fighting a guy who might not have a title, but who's going to be stylistically problematical for him in Amir Khan. So I'm not here claiming that Floyd Mayweather has ducked guys at 147 pounds, right? Let's remember, too, Mayweather was ready to fight Manny Pacquiao. They had agreed to terms. Mayweather just wanted drug testing. That's when that fell apart. So, my point is simply this. Right now, if you want a collision course at 147 pounds, look at the two unbeaten fighters who have both beaten Juan Manuel Marquez in the division. Right? If Timothy Bradley removes the doubt against Manny Pacquiao, he's the obvious challenger to the throne for supremacy at 147. And I'm not here talking about you know, these sanctioning body belts. I'm talking about in the hearts of the public. Right? You cannot go out there and beat the level of competition that Timothy Bradley has beaten. You cannot have the kind of endorsements from elite fighters that Timothy Bradley has received. Understand, you have one of the sports pound-for-pound -pound elite fighters, Andre Ward, openly saying, that Timothy Bradley in the amateurs was one of the hardest fights, one of the toughest opponents he had. Right? So let's stop the political game. Just like I wouldn't expect a major Democrat, let's say Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, at a Democratic convention to start bad-mouthing a Democratic nominee, that's the same way I would expect you know, Leonard Ellerby to push whatever the Mayweather agenda is. But we're fans. We're not owned by Mayweather or Timothy Bradley. Right? We understand at 147, if Bradley beats Pacquiao, and it's a big if, then there has to be a showdown between them. Let's talk about Kovalev. Now, let me say this. Kovalev, in my opinion, has the opportunity to become a top shelf fighter. He's already a champion. Let me say this, he's improving in fight after fight. He has a great corner, right? Double check me on this, but I believe when Don Turner, who assists John David Jackson in the corner, when Don Turner was the trainer for Emmanuel uh, excuse me, Evander Holifield. I believe Turner came in the ring with Holifield for one of these Tyson fights and was actually toyfully throwing a jab as he spoke to Holifield. You actually see the Turner influence on Sergei Kovalev. Kovalev now is really improving his jab quite a bit. Right, let me say this. To the elite fighters at 168 and 175, Kovalev's a light heavy, right? To Bernard Hopkins, to Andre Ward, to Babu Shumanov, who's underrated, Hopkins' is next opponent, right? I don't say this lightly. You need to fight Kovalev soon because if you wait, it's going to be too late. You want to hop on these young lions before they figure out their way around the jungle, right? Mike McCallum fought Julian Jackson early before Jackson became the monster he was way back when, right? You're better off fighting these young lions before they become older, smarter lions, right? Now, let me just say, Kovalev's left hook is devastating. You saw Cedric Agnew hit the canvas several times after getting hit with the left hook. But for me, the best part of this telecast, the most revealing part of the telecast, 
was after seeing a nice straight left hand to the body from Kovalev that ends the fight. It was Kovalev's post-fight interview where he said that he noticed, as he put it, an open place in his defense, Agnew's defense. So Kovalev in the ring made adjustments. Right now, I've called Kovalev a mid-range hooker in the past. But he's adding parts to his game. He's very adaptive, reactive. Right? He, he started also doing things that shows a desire to set up his punches better. Right? Just like Vladimir Klitschko against Tony Thompson in the rematch, right? Ironically, Thompson's a lefty, just like Cedric Agnew, right? There came a time in this fight where Kovalev, instead of just randomly throwing punches on a guy he had knocked down two times already in the fight, Kovalev starts doing things like shoulder fakes and, you know, starts trying to juke him and stuff like that. And Kovalev's left hand, the power in that left hand, is not just a left hook up top. He can throw a straight left, a left jab to the body. Right? So Kovalev, you know, big time puncher. One of the sport's elite punchers. Kovalev's not wrote. Right, he's actually a guy throwing feints and throwing punches based on what he sees his opponent doing. So this guy is very dangerous, and what I like too is that jab. He's now popping the jab, but it doesn't stop him. He's fighting out of a right-hand stance. The jab is his left hand. It doesn't stop him from pretending to throw a jab, and instead coming with the kind of body shots, you know, jab to the body, right? You know, left hooks up top. That dropped Agnew. Now, let me say this, though. And I understand the world is celebrating. I've seen articles warning Kovalev to fight everyone under the sun, including Janady Golovkin. Let me just say, though, that... This reminds me of young George Foreman in the 70s, right? There's too much front foot with Kovalev right now. As I said, he's the fastball pitcher who's learning the sport while being a champion, right? He's too front foot heavy. Understand, guys who are mostly on their front foot they're very good fighters. But if you think about the elite level, right? Floyd, Bernard, Andre, you know the guys I'm talking about. These guys will keep you guessing on whether they're going to be coming forward or going backward, right? Kovalev, who has never fought past the eighth round, is a front foot guy. You know he's offensive. He's going to overwhelm guys like Cedric Agnew, right? Guys with passive defenses, guys who aren't pushing the issue. But style-wise, understand, there's an open question on how Kovalev does against the guy who can force him on his back foot. That great left that I talked about earlier, and Kovalev's two-handed, he has power in both hands. The Agnew fight, he showcased the left hand, right? But that great left can be smothered, right? Think Bernard Hopkins, Felix Trinidad way back when, right? Kovalev against a fighter. Let's pretend for a second that Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. 
is a light heavyweight, right? And I know some people are laughing. Understand, he's fought some fights weighing well north of 175. Let's say it's Chavez Jr. against Kovalev. If Chavez Jr.'s punch can carry to 175, right? Because Chavez Jr., you know, was middleweight champion, 160. Right now he's fighting at 168. It's an open question whether his punch would carry to 175. But if it did, and if Chavez Jr. decided to fight inside on Kovalev, decided to do something Ishmael Shalak did not do, to do something Cedric Agnew did not do, to do something Gabriel Campillo did not do, to do something Nathan cleverly could not do if Chavez Jr. decided to come up on Kovalev. And keep in mind, Chavez Jr. is tall. If he decided to come up on Kovalev, smother the jab and the left hand, go to work on Kovalev's body, turn Kovalev from the hunter into the hunted, what exactly would happen, I don't think we know. Right? Kovalev's adding parts to his game right now. But just understand, as great as his fastball looks right now, he has big-time punch. And as improved as he has been over the last few fights, right? His corner's done, really, an A-plus job. This is kind of like the job Robert Garcia is doing with Marcus Maidana, right? It's an A-plus job, right? But just ask yourself, what happens if he's forced on his back foot? Also, I know Cedric Agnew tried to take this fight to the later rounds, right? The problem with Agnew is it's a passive defense and he didn't play it right, right? If you're going to try to rope a dope, a guy like, you know, Kovalev, you really need to force him to engage a little bit more, and you need to be closer to him, right? I thought Agnew, unfortunately, was too often on the end of these left hands. Let me also point out, too, that if you're just going to have your hands up rabbit ear style, you have to bend at the waist. Your elbow has to make it down around your waist. It has to. Otherwise, an adaptive reactive slugger like Kovalev will be able to do what he did. Throw hard punches under your elbow. If you're standing upright like Agnew, those punches are going to land right around your liver and kidney area, right? So, I thought Agnew didn't work it right, right? I believe a guy like Hopkins, and let me say, I don't want to see Hopkins against Kovalev simply because Hopkins is almost 50 years old, right? Kovalev is the kind of guy who hits so hard, I worry about the young guys he's fighting. I don't want to see Kovalev landing big punches on a senior citizen. But I'll concede Hopkins would have opportunities against Kovalev. Because if you can come inside of Kovalev's hook, if you could smother his left hand, just like Hopkins smothered Felix Trinidad's left hand, if Hopkins fights the same fight that he fought against Felix Trinidad, and if he's able to grapple with Kovalev inside, Kovalev could have problems. Also, understand too, just like Foreman in the 70s, these sluggers look great the first half of a fight. Wasn't it Foreman who was falling down at, you know, in the rumble in the jungle, he hits the canvas, Against Jimmy Young, different fight. He falls down in that fight late, right? There are questions about Kovalev's stamina. He hasn't been tested. He hasn't been 
ravished inside by someone like a Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Right? That would cause him to actually use a lot of his stamina so that when we got to the later round, stamina was an issue. Here, he knocks out Agnew in the seventh round. Right? My point is simply, Kovalev's an excellent prospect. No question about it. But, right, until we see how he reacts to a guy inside on him, until we see how he reacts when someone takes away that big time left, until we see him in a grappling match, against a guy with an active defense, not a passive defense, then I can't put him yet in the class of Floyd, Andre, Bernard, dare I say, Timothy. Right? Let me hear from you. Let me also say this too. The Golovkin, Chavez Jr. fight, I think that's a competitive match, right? Let me just say, um, Chavez Jr., I've criticized him openly here online, right? Anyone who's getting stopped under suspicion of drunk driving during a training camp is a bit ridiculous to me, right? Anyone who doesn't train seriously before fighting Sergio Martinez is completely ridiculous to me. Anyone who has a revolving weight clause you know where that first Brian Vera fight we didn't even know what weight the fight was going to be at because Chavez Jr's weight was fluctuating and promoters wanted that fight to take place Brian Vera of course had to play along as they fooled around with the weight limit on the fight so yeah Chavez Jr is not the poster child of a dedicated fighter but he can fight inside. Skills pay the bills. Right? I love Janady Golovkin. Longtime viewers here know I love Janady Golovkin. I believe I, I have made a video a while back saying Janady Golovkin and Tyson Fury are going to be future stars in boxing. But there's an open question with Janady Golovkin, just like there is with Sergei Kovalev on what happens when a guy gets inside. Right? I think it's an open question. Right? Janady Golovkin, he's another guy who looks great on his front foot. If boxing was just about front feet, okay, great. He's the man. Unfortunately, boxing sometimes requires that you know how to fight backing up. Right? You look at great fighters, whether it's Ray Robinson, whether it's James Tony, These guys can actually fight backing up Ali. Right? The phantom punch. Ali's backing up. Lands a shot. That finishes Sonny Liston. Right? Is that Janady Golovkin? Or are the film footages all front foot, hunt and destroy destructions, right? I think Chavez Jr. against Golovkin is a good fight. If Chavez Jr. holds the weight, well, I'd love to see Chavez Jr. against Kovalev. I think Bernard Hopkins would have some things to do against Kovalev, right? Kovalev looked great, no question about it. George Foreman looked unbeatable in the mid-70s, right? I'd like to see Kovalev at least get pushed to the later rounds in one of these fights. I'd like to see Kovalev, who now has a jab, who's coming in at a side profile, who is adaptive, reactive, who has the punch, right? I'd like to see him actually doling out some punishment backing up. I'd like to see how he reacts to body shots. In some, he's an exciting prospect, but the jury's still out. Let me hear from you. Right? Do you have a verdict on Kovalev and Golovkin? 
Let me also say this too. There's another guy. Better chess player, in my opinion, than most in the sport. Right? This guy might be one of boxing's truly troubled individuals. Jurgen Bramer. I'll tell you what, I know it sounds crazy. I'd love to see Bramer against Sir Jack Kovalev. Because Bramer is a master chess player up close. The kind of fighter who would give Bramer problems is a guy who's going to be jumping away from the chess board. Right? Because Bramer isn't the most mobile fighter I've seen. But a guy who's going to stay at the chess board, who's front foot heavy, who might come up and wait, but is still in front of the chess board, and then is moving forward, isn't throwing combinations backing up, right? That guy could have problems against Bramer, who has excellent defense. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.